Coca-Cola and Slurpee. It could only happen at 7-Eleven. It's a necessary step for any business to identify demand and capitalize on it. Some businesses create new products that also create demand. Some do it the other way around. When it comes to the business model, it's highly unlikely that a business can turn into a big enterprise by following product demands alone. New business models are constantly coming into the market and throwing away old models every day. To tackle this and create not only one of the biggest retail stores in the USA, but to expand themselves as one of the biggest brands in the world is nothing but an impressive feat. Today, we're talking about 7-Eleven. It all started when most American households depended on ice factories when it came to storing foods. In the early 1920s, most Americans didn't have access to electricity, and even if some places had access to it, buying a refrigerator was almost impossible for most families. At the time, people used to buy a big amount of ice from ice factories and kept them in the house to store foods like meat, milk, and other perishable products. John Jefferson Green, an employee of Southland Ice Company, saw an opportunity in this situation. He asked his boss if he could sell food items in the ice shops on the side. His boss agreed, and John Jefferson started selling eggs, milk, and bread inside the ice shop in 1927. This small business idea became an instant hit in the neighborhood, and people started to buy them from the ice shop regularly instead of just storing them in-house in bulk. John Jefferson did one more thing that changed the business model completely. At the time, most of the retail stores or shops were closed during the weekend, but since there was a daily demand for ice, ice shops had to stay open daily. This brought more customers, and quickly. This new business model was being practiced in other Southland Ice Company shops as well, and sure enough, they were doing great. So great, they managed to make more money from selling food items than from selling ice. In 1928, one of the store managers named Jenna Lira brought a souvenir from Alaska and put that in front of her shop. It was a totem pole, a monumental carving found in Western Canada and the Northwestern United States. This totem pole served as a marketing tool for her shop and it worked amazingly. People started to visit the shop to see the monumental carving and that also brought a big number of customers to her shop. Hearing this, the Southland Ice Company went to Alaska and brought totem poles for their other shops as well. This marketing made their shop officially known as totem stores, but generally people started calling them totem shops. After a couple of years, electricity and refrigerators were both becoming available to American citizens. The ice selling business was facing a crisis because soon after a couple of decades, people won't need ice to store goods anymore. But Southland Ice Company didn't go through this period because they had successfully changed their main income source by accident. One of the directors of Southland Ice Company, Joe C. Thompson Sr., already understood the potential of selling basic goods in the neighborhood, so he completely bought the company and renamed it Southland Corporation. In 1929, a major stock market crash in the United States started the Great Depression. This affected the United States gravely, as businesses started shutting down and a majority of people became unemployed. In 1931, this economic depression sent Southland Corporation to the brink of bankruptcy. It was a Dallas banker, W. W. Overton Jr., who helped revive the company's finances by selling the company's bonds for seven cents on the dollar. This brought the company's ownership under the control of a board of directors, but the struggle continued because soon after the Great Depression was over, they had to tackle the World War II crisis as well. In 1946, Southland Corporation decided to rebrand itself and renamed its shop 7-Eleven. The name was nothing but another marketing tool to let the consumer know about their business hours, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. But then, another accidental miracle happened, and 7-Eleven followed through that miracle again. In 1963, the University of Texas football team entered a local 7-Eleven shop in Austin, Texas. They were coming from a tournament and decided to celebrate inside the shop, causing it to extend its regular operation hour. When they left, other students also started to come to the shop, which let 7-Eleven operate for 24 hours for the first time. At the time, some of the businesses were also providing 24-hour services, but 7-Eleven found the 24-hour business model accidentally, and soon after this incident, they began to implement a 24-hour, 7-days-week schedule for their other shops. It worked really well for them, because customers were now heavily relying on 7-Eleven due to its availability. 
In the early 1950s, Omar S. Nedlik, an ice cream shop owner, accidentally invented a beverage that put 7-Eleven on the map like no other product did before. One day, Omar Nedlik noticed that one of his soda fountains was broken. To keep the soda cool, he had to store them in the freezer, but when he took the soda out, he realized that the soda had a slushy consistency. Omar Nedlik also realized that customers liked the soda this way more than the regular way. This gave Omar Nedlik the idea to make a machine that will create the slushy beverage. He then hired an artist named Ruth E. Taylor to design a logo and think of a name for the newly invented product. She originally named the drink Icy, and her designed logo is being used even today. In 1965, 7-Eleven offered Omar S. Nedlik's The Icy Company to sell this product inside their shop under two conditions. One, they have to rename the product for 7-Eleven, and two, they can only sell this product in 7-Eleven shops. Under a non-compete clause, both companies agreed to the terms and conditions, and in 1966, this slushy beverage began selling in 7-Eleven shops under the name of Slurpee. Slurpee was a huge success for 7-Eleven. Slurpees were being sold all over the country, and an estimated 12 million Slurpees were being sold every month. Quickly, 7-Eleven was known as the place that sells Slurpee. This is also the product that made 7-Eleven enter the franchise market. 7-Eleven operates, franchises, and licenses 78,029 stores in 19 countries and territories. As of September 2022, 7-Eleven has a market cap of $34.97 billion. This makes 7-Eleven the world's 457th most valuable company by market cap. If we look closely, one might think that 7-Eleven succeeded because they were lucky. Yes, they had some luck when it comes to transitioning, but there's no denying that people who are behind the company understood the market and the opportunities in front of them. They survived the toughest times and revived like other companies did, and they're thriving still today. 7-Eleven came with a consumer-friendly business model which helped shape the retail industry. And for that, everyone has to admit the amount of impact that 7-Eleven has made in our life.